See, I'm just gonna ride the way until the morning sun. If I just speak into existence, it's already done. It's already done. It's already done. If I just speak into existence, it's already done. Welcome to part two to our continuing conversation with Dr. Lineal Henderson, the president of our nonprofit 501c3 Sissy Mary Sue Education Fund. He's the president of our board of directors. Uh, I hope that you enjoy this next conversation. Okay, so let's, uh, we're going to switch gears just a touch. Uh, and this one is, uh, let's talk about um, your beautiful wife. How did you meet her? I personally love the story uh, because you are a, um, you are a man who just values and honors female empowerment and, and bright women. So give us that story that you had shared with me about when you saw her stretched out with all her, ac her business acumen glory. Do you remember what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. I Absolutely. Uh, it, it was, uh, I was very fortunate because I was introduced by uh, a friend who's a, a black female entrepreneur herself, whose firm I had worked for. Okay. And uh, at the time I was a bachelor. And she says, I, I got somebody I'd like you to meet. And wisely, she said, you don't have to fall in love. She's just a nice person. I think you enjoy meeting her. She was working at Westinghouse at the time and in their Grand Rapids office in the furniture division. Okay. And she was being transferred by Westinghouse to the energy division in Baltimore. Okay. And I happened to be at the University of Baltimore at the time. So that's, uh, so uh, we talked on the phone for at least three or four months before we ever saw each other. And wait, I think the, wait, the love I, really started there. Oh, wait, 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 yeah. you, ta you talked yeah. on the phone, say that again. Yeah, we, we, didn't, we didn't see each other in person for a good three to five months before we actually met. And uh, wow. so immediately the person I was listening to on the phone, you know, I, I, I felt this attraction to because of her mind, her spirit, uh, her family values, her community values. And, uh, you know, this was out without knowing anything about her physically. Yeah. Because you know how we young men are, you know, <laughs> we have to check the physical assets yes. in order to determine whether this is going to be a joint venture or not, you know? Yeah. And so uh, uh, we decided to meet in Washington, D.C. at the home of her older sister, uh, who is now our only remaining sibling. And okay. so we met at her house, not, not, not having seen her before. Um, I didn't know what she looked like. So it turns out when I rang the doorbell, her older sister came to the door. Mm -hmm. And the sister had been to a church function and she had this really matronly outfit on. And I said, you know, to myself, you know, talking about Karen, the friend that introduced us, Karen, I'm going to kill you. you know. <laughs> but uh, out from behind, Ripa is her name, who is also very beautiful herself, comes Joyce. And I, I immediately saw her and said, I'm not even in this woman's league, you know. Wow. And uh, I made a mistake of saying that to Joyce one time. And this is the angriest I've ever seen. And she said, you don't even know what league I'm in. So be quiet, just play. And, uh, and so we, we, we just, we hit it off very well. But the obstacle was that I had just been uh, selected as the head of the political science department at the University of Tennessee. Okay. So I had to relocate to Knoxville. Okay. So we bought a house and everything. And she, she, she hung in there with me and uh, wow. we didn't miss seeing each other for two, in that two year period. But one weekend, only one weekend out of two wow. years. Wow. So I decided that I was going to uh, ask her to marry me, and I was afraid that she was going to say no. So I had a whole sort of set of responses rehearsed when she said no, and, you know, I was going to oh. go in the forest for a while and all that. Kind of thing. <laughs> and you... she said yes, to my great surprise. Yeah, oh. she did. It was a surprise. Oh. And so when we, we got, uh, um, you know, we, we've been having but she's a very, she's really the intellect in the family. Uh, she's very, very bright, uh, huge heart, yeah. huge heart, yeah. dedicated. You talk about empathy, uh, yeah. every member of the family, uh, whether wow. it's my side of the family, her side of the family, or somebody 
who we just know in the community. Yeah. Her heart is the most empathetic I've seen. She, oh. she will spend time with them. She will be there with them. She will cook right. for them. She will do whatever gives them comfort. You know? wow. uh, so she has taught, taught me how to love people. And wow. uh, uh, it's absolutely amazing. But she's tough. She's tough. She's mm -hmm. a no-nonsense person. Mm -hmm. And the story I like to tell the most is what I told you. When she was with the vice president for mobile satellite solutions at Westinghouse, Mm -hmm. She became the head of the international division mm -hmm. of Westinghouse that negotiates collaborations between Westinghouse and the telecoms of other countries. Mm -hmm. So we happen to be in Australia together. Uh, State Department sent me down on a lecture tour. Westinghouse sent her down to work out a deal with uh, the big telecom in, in uh, Australia. Uh, and... Um, I finished my meetings before she finished her meetings. Mm -hmm. And so she said, well, why don't you come to the last meetings with me? And I, I said, I don't want to interfere with you. No, nah, come on, no problem. So I went and I sat in the back of the room while she was dealing with these all white Australian men. Mm -hmm. And George is about five feet tall, so mm -hmm. real little lady, mm -hmm. but a huge, huge projection. Right? So right. these guys were giving her a rough time. They were giving her a rough time. And she stops the meeting. And she turns to the guy perpetrating most of it, and she says, you know, Roland, no one can deny your academic background, your skills, and even your meager contributions to our <laughs> proceedings today. However, there are moments when I wish I was a dog and you were a tree. Now, let's go to the next item on the agenda. Oh uh, it didn't miss a beat, you know. And, yeah, so the guys after at the reception were gathered around me saying, is that your wife? Is that right? Yes. How do you do it? Very carefully. Um, and, uh, but, but I like that about her, that she has this huge intellect, this huge uh, leadership ability, yes. but she's never egotistical yes. about it. She's never egotistical yes. about it. Yes. She, and she doesn't, doesn't, mind, doesn't mind standing up to you and telling you, hey, you're going the wrong way. Right, you know? right. And giving you the evidence right. for it. So right. I feel I've been very, very fortunate, very fortunate. Uh, in May, we will have been married 33 years Aww. and uh, still speaking, still speaking. <laughs> and, and so, so uh, I, uh, my, my uh, nephews and nieces, they want to know the secret. How did we do this? You know, yeah. and I said, well, what happens as you get older uh, is you con confuse maturation and exhaustion. <laughs> you think you're becoming more mature. You're just too tired to do the stuff you used to do. So, <laughs> right. But you mark off maturity. You know? That's right. Oh, I love that. Plus, plus, oh. plus I always, as I always do, you know, those beds in the homeless shelter are too small for me anyway. So there you go. Um, there you go. But we have been very, very blessed. That's right. Very blessed. And oh. uh, it's wonderful when you're, when you're married to your leader. It's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's really cool. Your your marriage seems to yeah, your marriage seems to inform I would think your ability of mentoring and teaching uh your female students. Greatly. Because, yeah. Greatly. Yeah. Yeah, cuz we feel it. I and and as and as a person who works with you, I'm exec director and you are the president. Uh, we, you know, it's beautiful latitude. You are so empowering and encouraging and, and, and I know it comes from having a brilliant wife that you respect. Now tell me it how does. many, yeah, for sure. It just does. So tell me how many kids you have and then how many grandkids? Uh, the ones I know about, let me see. Uh, <laughs> I have two sons, yeah. uh, one 44 and one who will be 36 this year. Okay. And uh, between them, I have uh, five uh, grandkids and three great grandkids. Okay. And uh, they're all the cutest, and they all have captured our hearts, you know. Yes. Uh, and the thing I love about my sons, among uh, everything, is that we've grown up sort of respecting each other and yeah. we've raised each other. Yes. But they've become great dads, they've become great fathers, and uh, oh. really good with their kids. Oh. So that I. I definitely appreciate it. And the oldest son is in San Jose, California, mm -hmm. and the youngest son is in Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. okay. So we've been uh, richly blessed. Aw. Aw. Don't you have a fairly new, is there like a one or two-year-old 
uh, grandchild. Yeah. 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 One uh, one year old uh, little Kalani. She's uh, she looks just like her dad, and she is she uh, is a daddy's baby. There's no question about it. When uh, he comes in the room, she just lights up, becomes animated, and the whole thing. And, and uh, you feel the same way about her. So uh, it's a beautiful thing to see. And uh, and also they are they say certain things. The older ones. That just crack you up. I mean, they just, right. you know, they're 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 aware of what's going on, you know. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> my, yes. My, my little grand uh, grandson, when he was about five or six, we took him to a restaurant, and you know, he saw these two pretty openly gay men come in, and and they're kissing yeah. each other, you know. Yeah. And he's really intrigued by them, so mm -hmm. he leans over to me quietly and says, "Grandpa, Grandpa." Are those two fellows homosexuals? You know, <laughs> homosexuals. No, they're not sophists. Uh, yeah, I said no. They're not. They're not sophists, grandson. No, they just happen to love each other. And yeah. Said, oh, okay then. Okay. Aww, yeah. And that's then the adorable. youngest, uh, the, the five-year-old is. Uh, she loves Beyonce and Lizzo and yeah. Um, you know Rihanna and all, and she knows all of the lyrics, the moves, and so on. And so I told my, my son. This is wonderful, but you keep the girl away from a pole, whatever you do, keep away <laughs> from a pole. That's right. But keep they're, her they're in college. Around. COVID, yes. Keep her in college. COVID has really restricted our interactions a great deal. Uh, oh, I bet. You know, we have yeah. not been able to see and be with each other as often as we would have been. Right. But That's I think right. that will change and that we'll get yes. caught up. Yes. But they like to face FaceTime and, and they remind me of. Uh, the fact that they know what's happening, uh, especially before COVID, I uh, took the grandson trick or treating with his pals, and, and a Darth Vader outfit that he insisted on me wearing. Did you really? And I made the mistake. Oh my gosh! Saying, yeah, I, I, I said, Luke, I'm your father. <laughs> and he said, Grandpa, Grandpa, you don't want to say, you don't want to say that in Baltimore. There'll be a paternity suit on you tomorrow. <laughs> yes, said, that's right. Thank you, son. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're so funny. <laughs> oh my gosh again yes. awesome humor okay let's we're gonna go um lightning round i'm just kidding we'll do the same rate um so let's go to this next line of questions uh and it starts it goes back to your family now uh you came from a wonderful social justice and civically minded family uh can you share a history with us uh about that yes uh my uh Mother and father met in New Orleans. Okay. Uh, dad was from Mississippi. She was from New Orleans, staunch Catholic. Dad was a Baptist, uh, about 10 years older than she was. And uh, they had that instant connection, but they couldn't get married initially because he wasn't Catholic. Okay. So he converted to Catholicism. And being in New Orleans, New Orleans is a, a wonderful city, wonderful history, very cultural but racist yeah. and uh so uh after the first four of us were born uh, that marriage my mother and father said our kids are never going to have the palette of opportunities they should have living in this city yes and they decided that they were going to move to california and uh dad worked as a pullman porter for the southern pacific railroad so he could get free tickets to take the train from uh, New Orleans to California. Okay. And it was as exciting for us those uh, little kids to be on the train, look out the window, and yeah. they feed you on the train. And they have a little bed for you to stay on, and you stay there. And we were all excited about that. None right. of us realized that between New Orleans and F Flagstaff, Arizona, we were in the colored section of the train. And uh, and then you get to California and you don't come into San Francisco, you come into Oakland because okay. that's where the big rail yards were. And then okay. you take the ferry to San Francisco. Growing up in San Francisco was interesting because San Francisco has this wonderful reputation of being an open, progressive city, but mm -hmm. uh, not in every respect. So we found ourselves for the first five or six years in San Francisco in public housing. Mm -hmm and mostly all black public housing. And mm -hmm. this is where my mother and father became activists because 
they began to uh, protest against the housing authority there on the conditions in this public housing and uh, the racism. And this is where I got my first look at them as social activists. Yes. Later, they became uh, more focused on, on education as we started to get into school. Mm -hmm. And they kept, uh, when we moved to uh, another part of San Francisco, they kept a public school open that was going to close. And this school was right across the street from where we lived. So they kept it open. And oh. they were the ones that got us involved in the Save the Bay campaign. This was a San Francisco Bay mm -hmm. because being in those projects, uh, there were landfills there, there were meatpacking plants, there was yes. the Navy, all these things were grievous polluters. Yes. And so the San Francisco Bay was absolute environmental mess. Yes. And so my folks got involved with a lot of white folks actually uh, in the Save the Bay campaign. And when I came east many years later, I saw these little bumper stickers with Save the Bay on them. I said, boy, mom and dad really had a hell of an impact, you know, it's way <laughs> out here. No, they were talking about the <laughs> Ches Chesapeake Bay. Yeah. But the oh, first funny. sensibility oh, about that really, really came from that. And they got an award from the San nice. Francisco Foundation for their activism, nice. uh, which went to the community-based organization that they were wow. working with. So they were definitely role, role models for us. Uh, yes. And they, they, they did it in a way that wasn't, uh, how can I put it? They, they said, this is what you're supposed to do. This is not really extraordinary. I mean, this, yes. is, this is what you're there to do. Yes. And uh, they would go out and talk to people in the neighborhood. And I saw, you know, empathy really at work there. Mm -hmm. uh, just in the way they would listen to folks, mm -hmm. whether they were Samoan, whether they were Latino, whether they were Black people, whether they were Chinese, Japanese, uh, or white. Mm -hmm. uh, the folks would listen to them very carefully and then come back and talk about what they had learned. You know? mm -hmm. and, uh, so all of that uh, was like going to school. Yes. And uh, so that, that's where we got it from. And uh, I miss them very much. Uh, dad passed away uh, while I was at fielding winter session in Aww. 2004. Aww. And mom Sorry. passed away in 2016. Okay. And uh, so, but I can hear their voices like it was yesterday. I bet. I bet. I bet. That's just such a profound. Yeah. yeah, that had to. Yeah, that had to have had such a profound impact. I just can. I haven't. You know, I don't. I haven't seen pictures of your parents, or obviously, I hadn't met them. But I know that they work through you. It's yeah, it's beautiful. Um, oh, well, yeah. They, they, they are. Uh, I would be dead without my mother, that's for sure, because she's the one that detected the rheumatic fever in me at age six. And I was in a convalescent home for two years. If she, if she had missed those signals, I'd be dead now. Neil, I forgot about that. I think you told me that story before. Wait, how old, remind yeah. me how old you were again? Six. You were six. And yeah. then you were in- And you... I came out of- Go ahead. I was in the Stanford convalescent home for two years wow. and uh it, it, the bad news about that of course was rheumatic fever was nothing to fool around with and they treated it with mega doses of penicillin to which i'm allergic now okay the good news about it though is because i couldn't go to school i had to do a lot of learning and reading on my own mm -hmm. and that's in many ways the best kind of learning and reading yes when you're into it because you want to do Yes. And uh, so, but I owe, uh, owe everything to the folks. I really do. And wow. My dad was just a hero to me. He was, he was a tough guy, uh, mm -hmm. to, no nonsense, but uh, you know, he, he learned electronics after the age of 40. Um, wow. By reading the manuals out loud to himself. And he was so funny. He said, wow. the side effect of reading all those manuals was that, um, I talk to myself all the time. So I finally <laughs> asked him about that. And he said, he said, well, uh, you may think that's funny, but I'm determined before every day ends, I'm going to speak to at least one intelligent person. <laughs> and uh, so that's the way he shut me up about that. That's he's funny. So funny. He's a real comic. Oh yeah. my God. Wow. Very, really, very religious. Dad yeah. was a good convert to Catholicism. Uh, 
And we went to the Catholic men's retreat. He went to the Catholic married couples retreat, mm -hmm. uh, literally religiously. And yeah. he was, <laughs> when we were little kids, he was the only one that drove. My mother didn't drive. Okay. So he had relics on the dashboard of the car to protect us while we were driving. Everybody was up there. Oh my gosh. Jesus, Mary, Joseph, St. <laughs> Saint Anthony, St. Jude. For affirmative action, they had Martin DePoris, who was the only black saint. So, so wow. I finally got enough nerve to ask him about it. I said, Dad, when these people were here on earth, they had absolutely no experience operating a, a motor vehicle. Yeah. So they can't help you, I don't think, technically. Yeah. And by the way, if you want them to protect us, turn them around and have them looking at the traffic, man. Don't have them looking at you. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know what happens when you challenge your folks like that. Oh, that They'll didn't turn go around well. and say to you, I got this. I got this. I got this. That's it. Dad, I know you got it. The question is, do the saints have it? <laughs> oh my God. Anyway. Wow. wow. But you could joke around with them like that. And, you know, yeah. He was, they were good parents. They were yeah. good parents. Oh Reinforcing gosh. the yeah. point that we made earlier about the children raising the parents because my father and mother told me at different stages that they would have never done or become what they became if they didn't have children. Yes. 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 Wow, that's powerful. They felt they felt more strongly to stand up for the fact that your housing was close to, you know, nefarious, dangerous kinds of, you know, physical entities um, that would impact you and other families. Uh, and yeah, that's right. And, right, right. And then and then other other choices. Love that. Love that. Love you that's pulled right. that back to that again. That. It's wonderful. Um, Gosh, yeah, I wish I could have met them. You had shared with me a story about how you became involved in international travel. And I think you're a high school student at the time. Do you want to talk about that story right. that opened your life up? Well, it was, again, uh, an empathetic teacher, Gail Layton, okay. Hungarian-American, whose parents were survivors of the Holocaust. She okay. was teaching world literature at Lowell High School in San Francisco, where I went to high school. Okay. Same high school Stephen Breyer went to. And uh, immediately, uh, she embraced all of her students, really. But she, as we say in the South, she took a shining to me. And she said, uh, <laughs> Henderson, you know, she had this little bit of accent. Uh, she said, Henderson, I, I've got something very important I want you to look at. I said, what is it, Miss Layton? She said, uh, here's some material from something called the Experiment in International Living. And uh, they send high school students and college students abroad for a summer or a semester, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I said, Ms. Layton, they're not gonna pick me. I mean, I, I've already been out of San Francisco, let alone for the overseas. And she said, no, you're perfect, you're perfect, you should do this. <laughs> and she stayed right on us. And we loved her so much yeah. that we would do anything she would tell us to do. So. Um, you know, there we go. So nice, nice, nice. So, now, uh, yep, go so, ahead. Uh, so we applied for it. We applied for it, and uh, I didn't think I'd be selected. So I said, "Hey, I'll, I'll go in and fill out the paperwork." So we had uh, a, a baseball game uh, where Lowell beat Lincoln. Now Lincoln always beat us, so we to beat them was a big thing. So okay. we were running down the hallway, screaming and yelling and celebrating. And here comes Miss Layton in the opposite okay. direction, okay. screaming and yelling and wait, waving a piece of paper. And she said, <laughs> you won! You won! I said, yeah, yeah, we beat Lincoln three to two. She said, no, you're going to Europe. I said, come on, Miss Layton, don't fool around, don't fool around. Oh, so, yeah. you've been selected. So I got That's selected awesome. and to go to Europe, go to Italy for the summer. Okay. And they paid for everything except wow. the air travel from San Francisco to the point of departure in the States, which was Newport News, Virginia, okay. about an hour from where I live right now. Okay. And we were going by boat. So my folks, the day after I graduated from high school, put me on the Greyhound bus uh, in San Francisco, headed to Newport News. Okay. It took five days. Oh so that was gosh. education. That was an education right there. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So I get and to Newport they... News, I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. Yeah. And the conversation of Italian was being taught at a black school, HBCU, mm -hmm. now called Hampton University. 
Mm -hmm. then called Hampton Institute. So mm -hmm. I get off the bus and then, you know, you psh, and here's the <laughs> president of Hampton, Mr. Anderson, we're going to be teaching you your conversational Italian. So I thought to myself, man, this is really cool. Yeah. Taking a conversational Italian in the black school. So I had yeah. the meanest Italian accent you ever heard, you know, Mona Love Sarah, it. brother, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Love it. And we got on the boat and, and Newport News with 27 other recent high school graduates from around the country. And uh, it took two weeks to get to Italy by boat. Wow. And it changed your life completely. Really? Changed life completely. Really? And I have a life, lifelong friend from that trip who was the daughter of the vice president of Chase Manhattan Bank, lived in Larchmont, New York in a mansion. Wow. And she was the person I got closest to. Wow. Very progressive. Uh, yeah. Right. And yeah. uh, so we stayed in touch all those years, nice. all these years. Nice. And she uh, eventually went to law school. Uh, she went, got her bachelor's, I think, at uh, Wisconsin. But she got her law degree at Louisiana State University, settled in my hometown of New Orleans, married a lawyer there, and became a federal judge appointed by Clinton. Wow. And she was a federal judge at sentenced Ray Nagan, the former mayor, to 10 years in jail for corrupt corruption. Really? And she was on that trip with me, and we stayed in touch all these years. This is what happens, you know. Yeah. So quite yeah. a set of experiences. Wow. And you said it changed your life. Um, in what ways exactly? Just the, the connections, your confidence that you built? Yeah. What? Exactly. That and then when you've been someplace overseas mm -hmm. that you only read about before, mm -hmm. now you sort of own it in your experience. Yes. So now you want to know everything about it. Yes. And it, it starts you to researching and reading things that you would not probably have read before. Yes. And then when I got back to San Francisco, I wanted to be more familiar with all of the Italian American communities in the San Francisco Bay Area. Oh. Uh, and uh, so that that broadened the horizon yes and, and then uh this young lady i'm talking about she had twin sisters who were younger than she was and they were selected to go to japan so she uh her sisters came and stayed with our family in san francisco for two weeks because uh they were going to osaka japan mm -hmm. and osaka is san francisco one of san francisco's sister cities Oh, wow. So all these connections, you know, and wow. so it was just, it was just beautiful. It's beautiful. wonderful. You know? It's so wonderful. That started, started me on a, on a global track that has been in existence all through the career. Wow. Uh, you know, we uh, did our postdoctoral work at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Mm -hmm. uh, I've done some work for the State Department in about 12 or 13 countries. Wow. Uh, and all of the continents. Wow. And uh, up until COVID, we went overseas, the wife and I, at least once a year yes. for 41 straight years. Yes. And then, wow. And then COVID did. Wow. Wow. That grounded you a touch. Goodness. It did. Um, it really wow. Did. Wow. Wow. Okay, so I want to um, go along these same lines, you know, around that same chronological time. Let's skip now to Berkeley. You went to Berkeley in the 60s. You began your undergraduate um, degree there, but you began, I believe, in physics. Uh, tell, tell, us, uh, tell the listeners what you ended up uh, studying ultimately and how your father felt about your switch. And then just talk to us about Berkeley. Okay. Well, Berkeley was a, a very activist place, um, more the students than the faculty. And okay. uh, I started out in physics because my daddy wanted a son with a degree in physics that could work with him in his electronics business. Oh, but when I, I got see. to Berkeley, uh, all these protests, all these protests were going on. There was a civil rights movement. There was the anti-draft movement, anti-Vietnam movement, yes. the feminist movement, the environmental yes. movement, free yes. speech movement, yes. consumer movement. Yes. And the only thing all of these movements could agree on was that physicists were the enemy because they made bombs and munitions. And right. So I changed my major to eco right. economics and political science, infuri infuriating my father, who okay. called me a series of technical names. Uh, <laughs> and he was mad at me for a long time. 
And oh. he's, he, they looked at political science. There ain't no science in politics. What are you talking about? <laughs> and so, uh, uh, but anyway, the physics came in handy later because uh, uh, one of the areas I focus on in my work is energy policy. Okay. And uh, I actually worked at the U.S. Department of Energy uh, for four years during the Carter administration. Okay. And uh, and was vice president for energy research and development at a small company based in Alexandria. Okay. So I've always sort of kept that portfolio. Whatever we experience, much like your own bi yes. biography, you don't you always incorporate it in your repertoire. Yes. And it never completely leaves you. Yes. And so that's what happened in that situation. Yes. And uh, Berkeley was life changing to me in another way because of all of these movements. But I also went to graduate school there, a master's and PhD. And uh, when I got to my PhD, uh, I came to the dissertation. I couldn't get any of these white folks to work with me. Really? Because I wanted to focus on black black administrators. So the person yes. that volunteered to work with me was somebody I would not have expected. A really? white man from Alabama who ha happened to be on the faculty, and he, he had this big, beautiful accent, and he came over and said, Laniel, I'm going to be your Harriet Tubman through this process. And oh, he was. You know, he was a great, it was a great dissertation chair. Wow. He made it possible for me to publish a, a book before I finished my dissertation. Wow. Uh, that book was published exactly, exactly 50 years ago this year. Wow. And uh, wow. his name was Victor Gunn. So, Wait, what you know, was his these, name? The, Wait, what was the his, life what was his name? name? Victor, Victor, Victor Jones. Okay. And uh, the life lesson there was that you never know uh, in movements and social justice who your deliverer is going to be, who your facilitator and Who's your collaborator your is going to be. That's it may very right. real. Yeah. Somebody you never expect. Yes. You know. Yes, uh, and the yes. ones that you expect are not there, not there to help you when you when they when they say that. Yes. So. Yes. Uh, Berkeley was great, and then I decided that uh, I would do my postdoc in, in a different part of the country because I didn't want to be all California. Mm -hmm. So that's why I went to Hopkins for the postdoc. Okay. That was a great experience. Awesome. Let me back you up for a second. So you did undergraduate um, in um, ec was it economics, political science. Right. Um, okay. And then yeah, was the right. master okay, was the master's degree the same and then was the doctoral degree the same the same disciplines? Was were they both the same? What were the titles of the master's degree? What was the title the, of the doctoral degree? The master's was public policy. Okay. Uh, and the doctorate was political science with a with an emphasis in public administration. Wonderful. And then what was the please yeah. tell me, what was the title of your dissertation? Or something uh, close. <laughs> black, black, black administrators in urban bureaucracies, and it became a book in 1979. Okay. Oh gosh, this is so cool. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, I I know I want to go to Hopkins, but I want to stay in Berkeley for a moment because you had shared with me that you met uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. while you were at Berkeley. And, and you told me this interesting uh, tactic he had to recruit people. Do you want to share that with the listeners? Sure. Well, King came to uh, the University of California in 1967 okay. for two interrelated purposes. One was to reiterate publicly in a public speech his opposition to the war in Vietnam, which okay. put him on the wrong side yes. of Lyndon Johnson, of course. Yes. And then the other purpose he had was to recruit students and faculty to come to his next big march, which was a poor people's campaign yes. planned for 1968. And so he came to meet with the Afro-American student unions first. Okay. And we were, first of all, shocked uh, when we saw him because we expected a big James Earl Jones right. type person. And, and this little hobbit, hobbit comes in about five foot six, five foot seven yeah. with his big voice. We were absolutely amazed at his erudition and his mm -hmm. scholarship. For, uh, mm -hmm. And then the other shock is he wanted to go to the student lounge. And we said, why? And he said, I want to go play pool. And we, <laughs> he took us down to the student lounge and we beat us mercilessly. In pool. <laughs> and so we, we, had, we just have to ask him, uh, 
Dr. King, you know, Nobel Prize winner, anti-war activist, humanitarian, pool player. Which yeah. one of those on the scene to belong? He says, well, I'll tell you, I, this is the way I recruit young men in the neighborhood of my church, churches, both at Ebenezer in Atlanta and at Dexter in Montgomery. I scour the neighborhood pool halls looking for them. And I tell them, if I beat you, no money. You don't have to give me any money. You just have to come to church on Sunday. We're going to buy you a suit, show you off, put you right in the front pews. So you got to win in order for that not to happen to you. And he got a surprising number of them in church that way. Right. And uh, we were impressed with him because he, he, for all of his national reputation and his eloquence and so on, interpersonally, he was very down to earth nice. and very empathetic. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And That's he was, awesome. He was pals. He was pals with the Dalai Lama. He was pals with uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. Uh, mm -hmm. And they actually co-published a book last year uh, called Beloved Brothers. And uh, he was the one that told me that story about the Dalai Lama, who also has a great sense of humor, comes yeah. out of his empathy, uh, yeah. where he's give, giving a lecture on Nirvana, on how to achieve inner peace. And some lady in the audience says, uh, Mr. Lama, uh, how does one truly achieve nirvana, peace? Mm -hmm. And he says, in that voice of his, you must learn to curb your appetites. <laughs> and so she quickly follows the voice. How do you do that? And he says, stay off the curb. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, stay off the curb. So, curb your appetite. That's yeah, awesome. Terrific humor. Oh, my gosh. So that's awesome. we did go to... We did. We were, were able to raise money for 34 of us to go to the Poor People's Campaign nice. in 1968. And of course, by the time we got there, King had been assassinated. Uh, yes. And the, the cities had been damaged heavily by riots. Wow. And uh, but we went anyway, and and wow. we were there all 42 days. Wow. And it rained 29 of them. Oh uh, but we stayed gosh. in Resurrection City, which was a, a little tent city that they erected there. Okay. And uh, it was also a life life changing experience, and that's where we met people like, uh, you know, uh, uh, the late uh, Congressman uh, Turner. John Lewis. Uh, oh, John Lewis. 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 John John. Lewis. That's where we met John Lewis. Yeah. Yes. And uh, he was an amazing. He was really amazing. Uh, he was so humble uh, and so soft spoken. We were surprised. We thought this that you know he'd be a rabble rouser. Right. He'd be like his predecessor, Stokely Carmichael, you know, but he was he was not that at all. He was contemplative. He was more like yeah. Robert Moses. Right. Uh, right. So uh, right. that happened at the Poor People's Campaign. We okay. met Dolores Werther there. OK. Uh, so, you know, a lot of big uh, leaders yeah. of civil rights organizations, Jesse yeah. Jackson and Ralph yes. Abernathy, James Bevel, uh, Andrew Young. Uh, uh, wow. Andrew Young impresses because he was he was the only non-Baptist preacher in the whole group. He's oh, wow. a congregationalist preacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, very quiet approach. And all of these guys were interesting. I mean, they, you know, they had their faults fault like we all do. They were all womanizers. All of them. Were they really? You know, oh, my god! Except for Andrew Young. Okay. Oh, yeah. Andrew Young was very devoted to, to, okay. his, to his late wife. Okay. And uh, so... We were impressed by those things as well as the, yes. the big issues we were supposed to be promoting. Yeah. Right, right, for sure. Now, I'm glad that you brought those up because those are questions down later and um, that I was going to ask about the yeah. Poor People's Campaign. And I didn't know it was 42 days and 29 of them were raining. Uh, gosh, I knew it was a long yes. period of time. But, you know, the one thing that, I, that I'd written down in a question is this. And, and you mentioned it, that, that Dr. Martin Luther King was killed right before that in Memphis. How, yes. can you talk, yes. gosh, can you talk to me about, this was a question I created, talk to me about how did you feel as a person wanting to support King and this, and this campaign after that happened, did that give you more courage to be a part of it? Did it, did it instill you with fear to where you weren't certain if you wanted to proceed? Give me some, or give our listeners some more information about that. I just, I'm really curious to hear that from you. Well, we went through various st stages. First, of yeah. absolute disrelief, devastation, and grief. Yes. That was the first. 
Yes. Uh, and all those naysayers of King toward the end of his life, we felt resentment toward him, toward them yes. because uh, they yes. didn't they didn't appreciate the presence of this man while he was there. You know? Yes. Uh, then we said, no, we can't give up. We have to go forward uh, with the mission. Yes. Uh, we have to go forward in spite of all of the things. And so it was a moment of an act of faith because he said, uh, even if something happens to me, remember the lives of so many people are at stake. And there's uh, more on the line than just my reputation or you know my vindication. So we decided yes. to go forward. And then uh, when we got there, we we were kind of mixed, had mixed feelings about it because when we arrived in the city, you could see the flames and smoke coming up from Washington, D.C., from the civil disturbances that were taking place along 7th Street, 14th yes. Street, H yes. Street, Northeast. Yes. Uh, the city was under siege. It would be, it would yes. be like going into Kiev today, you know. Wow. And, wow. Uh, wow. So we were a little bit discouraged about that. But we said, no, we, we, we made the commitment. We're yes. going to go through with it and yes. make you laugh a little bit. Uh, I got to turn. I have to turn in the term paper about it. On top of that, uh, <laughs> when I get back, to oh my gosh! So, oh my yeah. gosh! Oh yeah, yeah. The the, the, faculty, the faculty member who organized the trip for us uh, demanded a paper on our experiences. Wow! And uh, I'm glad he did because uh, yeah. that became kind of a yes. record of uh, you know what we experienced and how we experienced. And yes. one of the things that's attached to that paper, I think I have it around, it, are the minutes of a meeting that I took of the leaders of the Quick Quick Peace campaign who asked me to take those minutes. I, I had a typewriter there and I, I still have those minutes. And wow. I type in an old Smith Corona type. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, still had that. Wow. And the other thing that people don't remember that or should remember is that the Quick Peace campaign uh, was in many ways did not achieve what it intended to achieve. That was to put poverty on the agenda, on the platforms of both the Democrats and the Republicans in the yes. presidential election year. Yes. But it did result, it did result in two new civil rights laws, okay. uh, both passed in 1968. Okay. One was the Indian Civil Rights Act, which covered the rights of indigenous people who are not living on reservations, right? Mm -hmm. And the other was the Fair Housing Act, Fair yes. Housing Act, which we still yes. Are battling over today. So, That's so, right. Uh, it did get something done. It did get something done. Mm -hmm. And that was a wonderful experience because, uh, you know, there's always in any kind of social justice movement, agony and ecstasy moments. Yes. And uh, you know, so we saw, we saw, certainly saw that in Black Lives Matter, right? Yes. Where, yes. Uh, at, at the peak, you had people marching around the world in support yes. of Black Lives Matter. As well yes. as around the country, yes, yes. But the but the agony piece is that there's still not enough of an embrace of the principles and yes. the dynamics by public policymakers. Yes, that's, that's the agonizing part. And yes. killings continue to go on. Correct. Until killing continue to happen. You know? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And uh, so, and by by the way, we, we down here in Virginia, we got a little twist on this. We say. Uh, black Lives Matter is directed to the black community as well as to the white community, because we have a lot of uh, black on black murders and homicides. And uh, so we're trying to tell the, the, the folks who are involved in these things that black lives should matter internally as well as externally. Yes, yes, yes. What? <laughs> Do, do you yeah i thought that that's a really interesting thing that you bring up another uh black male friend was talking to me about that when i was admitting as a white woman that i feel like i'm complicit and even though i'm involved in the kind of work i am i can do more i can always do better and i feel like we all need to think that and he 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 affirmed it but then and i didn't need him to affirm it but i mean i was just say, stating it because i believe firmly in it uh, and he said, you know, though, Wendy, he said, we we have a lot of black on black crime and we also have to uh, have to all be involved with that. Now, this is my assumption. So help me help me understand this. 
Um, my assumption would be this. It would be that due to gen well, crushing oppression and racism, lack of opportunities, okay. exclusion, all these horrific things that have happened uh, generations upon generation that we have yeah. allowed to perpetuate, there are so many Blacks in our country who are carrying so much generational trauma uh, that that contributes to um, the unrest within and just so much pain that gets projected as violence. Is that a fair assumption and help help us? us that's with a fair that? assumption. Okay. No, that's a fair assumption. And I think uh, one of the things that we have to embrace and tell the truth about uh, are uh, the moments in our history, even right up to the present, okay. where Black folks, because of the structural racism, have been caught up in killing other Black people, either right. directly or indirectly, whether, whether they were Black slave catchers and overseers right. back during the period of slavery, right. or uh, gang and drug leaders, they sure. uh, patrolling and, and then taking over streets. Uh, you know, this is why those people who oppose critical race theory are not understanding Right. That this is a comprehensive story right. about human uh, indignity toward other humans. Absolutely. And it's not just white people and black people. That's right. And so the other side of it is that while there might be reason for a lot of white guilt to take place, you cannot generate empathetic, dynamic community uh, on the feedstock of guilt. Yes. So yes. you can't, it doesn't, it doesn't work, it does not work. So, yes. uh, because I can just point out equal number of examples where white folks have assumed risky leadership positions mm -hmm. and advocating for uh, non-white people all through history. I mean, I think about the Quakers, mm -hmm. you know, I think about the Mennonites, I think about mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the progressive branches of, of uh, religious organizations Mm -hmm. That it went down there to work with King, got killed, got stabbed, you know, et cetera. Right. Uh, they're part of this history too. Right. And uh, so I don't want any white person to come away from an experience or a conversation about race uh, or racism uh, feeling that the only thing they got out of that was more guilt. Yes. Because yes. Uh, that's going to disable, that disables them at a time when we need them at their most able. You know, that's so beautifully uh, spoken. So, so. Yeah, no, that, sorry, I didn't mean to jump on the end of your words. No. Um, oh, yeah. you're right. Yeah, that is so beautifully spoken. And the, the one thing that comes to my mind when you're talking about it in those terms is, um, you know how there's a continuum and on one end is empathy and on the other one is shame as described by, you know, Dr. Yeah. Brene Brown. That's the other thing at play here. So, so what you're saying too, in effect, is, is you don't want to perpetuate or or encourage or shaming people, guilt, shame, that, um, because yes, empathy is the answer for it. It's it's really trying to just encourage uh, that we all take the time to to lean in to one another in our world. You know how I speak in terms of um, empathy being a bridge, and I know others do too. Like if we think about that metaphor, that visual, empathy is a bridge um, for greater understanding through empathy. So I think a bridge gets you closer to be able to lean in, to hear the details of, of the person's life that you're speaking with or contemplating their life, right? And then it gives you the opportunity for that shared humanity piece to understand the similarities that this is a mirror, this is me, we're human beings like you're talking about. But then it also respects the uniqueness. When you lean in, you see the similarities, you see the shared humanity, but then you also can deeply respect the uniqueness, the unique life circumstances. Absolutely. Right? The unique history. Very How well put. Very well, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. And that's that's why, again, taking guidance from the New Testament, uh, this is why it was important for Jesus to remind uh, everybody that their sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That they're not. He's not there to make you guilty of uh, of sin so that it holds you down. 
right. but to forgive your sins so you can move on to who you were designed to be in the first place. Right? Wow. Uh, that's yes. why truth and reconciliation, truth and reconciliation commissions in uh, uh, Kosovo, Croatia, South Africa, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, this is why they're so important because right. the extension of amnesty to people who have been carrying guilt or have been charged with guilt it's yes. very important to liberate all of the parts of themselves that will be necessary for them to make a better and greater contribution going forward than they were making before. Oh, so if you can't give yourself amnesty, nobody else is going to do it. Gosh, that gosh, that's just beautiful. That I'm speechless about that. That is so powerfully said. Yeah, it's that absolutely. It's that self. It's that self empathy. It's that self. It's that. It's that self grace. It's the the same things that, like you said, that we learned from the teachings that we you know that we believe in, uh, in, in those ways that God bestows on us, that we can bestow on ourselves, and then exactly. we can. Mm -hmm, yeah. Wow. Well, and then, I'll, I'll, I'll give you another. Uh, the late Thurgood Marshall made a very important. <laughs> contribution to this because he said he was invited to help write the constitution for the new country of Kenya, you know, once okay. it, when it was liberated from the British in 1963. Mm -hmm. And he asked Tom and Tom and Boya and Jomo Kenyatta, the new leaders, mm -hmm. uh, are you going to continue to have uh, English people living in the highlands of Kenya? Mm -hmm. And they said, yes. Okay. And, and then he turned to them with this stern look on his face and said, your new constitution must also then protect their rights as well. Yeah. Yes. And that was, yes. could you imagine uh, no. somebody like Thurgood Marshall saying that to African liberation leaders? Right. Uh, you know, we're supposed to kill these people. Right. I mean, that was uh, King Radical. claim to fame was leading the Mau Mau movement. Yeah. Uh, yes. but, but he said, look, if, we, if we're going to have them in the country, you need to protect their rights in the constitution as well. Wow. And by the way, if Idi, if Idi Amin had done that, we wouldn't have had 56,000 people of Indian descent expelled from Uganda once right. he took over the country. That's right. That's right. So, That's right. So, uh, and, and the things that we are challenged by as human beings, including each other, we need everybody yes. at their peak. Yes. And if we are recruiting them, uh, with the baggage and, you know, the ankle weights of the past uh, guilt or past generation guilt, we're not getting them at their peak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that is really stunning and, and really wonderfully said. It's so true. And, and gosh, it's, it is absolutely true. Absolutely true that we want everybody to be the fullest of themselves and to be the most confident and, um, and respecting of their own yeah, their own their own contributions in life, their own possibility and potential for growth. Oh, no, it's just yeah, it's awesome. Along those lines, I do want you to share um, about when you met Gandhi and what that experience was like. I've met him in spirit. And oh, yes, definitely. He was assassinated, as you all recall, on, on January 30th of 1948. Uh, but reading his uh, many autobiographies, actually, and the Lewis Fisher biography of him, right? you feel like you know him because he, yes. he sounded a lot like you at the ages, you know. And he was such an influence on other people that I did meet, like Thurman and mm -hmm. King and so on, yes. that uh, I wanted to know more about him. And then having spent a lot of time in India, I came to appreciate what he had to go up against yes. uh, to, to, to help organize a liberation movement. Uh, yes. Most of his obstacles really came from the inside. Yes. You know. Yes. The Muslim, yes. the Muslim and Hindu schism, the mm -hmm. caste system, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. The um, the way that women were marginalized in Indian culture all the way along the line. Yes. Um, yes. And and the way the way he appreciated and embraced his wife's leadership in the movement. Right? Nice. Uh, this is all things that we really learned from him. Yes. And he said something I'll never forget ever. He said some of the most profound, uh, lasting, eternal messages have come, have come to us 
from people who were in jail. Interesting. Um, whether it was whether it was Jesus, you know, mm-hmm. whether it was Thomas mm-hmm. Aquinas, or, or whether it was mm-hmm. uh, Paul and Silas, Mar- Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Gandhi. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, there's something about jail that yes. is physically confining and spiritually liberating. Right. Right. Wow. And Can- uh, I'll, I'll never forget that. Yes. Yes. Can I back up with that for a second and say this um, to make sure the listeners understand this, or or maybe they already know this, but from what I had heard, and and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Gandhi was also uh, influenced by the the, uh, women's rights movement in in England. And when he watched, um, when he, yep. So when he watched women choosing nonviolence, civil disobedience where where the cops would just you know beat the crap out of them and women would just go limp and they would just not fight back that was a part two of where he had his idea is that correct i think that has a large contribution to it and by the way it was the women in india who led him to his other big influence and that was for Rabindranath tagore uh the writer and poet and artist who okay. won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913. When you really? read Tagore's Gitanjali, okay. you could see how that would influence Gandhi. You know, wow. uh, very powerful, very powerful track in which wow. he says things like, you know, go, go where you will from Benares to Mathura. These are all in India. Mm-hmm. If you have not found your own soul, the world is unreal to you. Oh, this wait, 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 wait. Oh, wait, wait. I apologize for interrupting, but you have to say that again. It's so powerful. Okay, Rabindranath Tagore uh, is a big influence on Gandhi. He was born actually a few years before Gandhi, but Gandhi was very much taken by what he had to say. And uh, he, he said in his book, Gitanjali, G I T A N L G I. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, or GLI, I'm sorry, Gitanjali, that you can go where you will from Benares to Mathura. If you have not found your own soul, the world is unreal to you. Wow. And then, wow. then he says something else that King, that King cited when he was organizing the Poor People's Campaign. He actually wrote this in the same book, Gitanjali. He said, uh, and this is, he's in Calcutta, India at the time. He said, I had gone begging as a poor people through the city streets uh, when suddenly thy chariot appeared like a golden dream. I would struggle up to the side of the chariot. I would look in the eyes of the royalty in the chariot. I would fling out my hands and they would bestow upon me alms and riches that I couldn't even hold. And so I did struggle through the crowd, walked up to the side of the chariot, flung out my hand. And to my great surprise, the royalty turned to me and said, what does thou have to give to us? Oh, what a royal jest to ask for alms from a baker. Uh, I knew not what to do or say. And so I went into my little tattered, uh, cloth there and pulled out the least little grain of corn and put it in the hands of the royalty. But how great my surprise when I returned home, home being under a tree limb on a broken street, and opened up my little tattered purse to see what I had gathered during the day, only to find among the pitiful heap the least little grain of gold. Wow. I bitterly wept wow. and wished that I had had I had had the heart to give the royalty my all. Wow. And you know, it seems like that. Just wow. grab Gandhi and grab Kim and grab Thurman. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. So that that's yes. So yes. And and there were a lot of women in England when he went to England. He also worked with the Socialist Party. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the movement there. Mm-hmm. Um, so there were a lot of women who were part of that movement. And he said, I embrace 
the equality in the aims of socialism. Uh, I only wish they were infused with more spirituality. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Absolutely. Uh, wow. Ama amazing man. Just, it, it, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and let's go, let's talk to th about Thurman next. Um, you, I had taken a Howard Thurman class at, at winter session and, and was just fascinated by, by Howard Thurman, the scholar, the mystic, uh, the writer, uh, he wrote that book, Jesus and the Disinherited, that, that Dr. Martin yes. Luther King carried with him everywhere. Can you talk about, uh, the, and then you gave me those beautiful uh, CDs that I listened to in my car. He's so, he is such an influential, empowering human being. Can you talk about what it was like to, uh, to meet with him? And I, well, one more quick thing I should share with the listeners that I learned and then help me again if I'm wrong about this, but I had read that Sue Bailey Thurman uh, went with um, Howard, Dr. Howard Thurman, and they were the two uh, first African Americans to have audience with him. Uh, and I think it was Sue Bailey Thurman who created the connection, but I'm not sure about that. Help me out with that and then talk to me about Thurman in real life. Well, they, they, they were a team, uh, okay. Sue Bailey Thurman and Howard Thurman. Uh, so how Howard Thurman was born in Daytona Beach, and uh, he said, my introduction to things spiritual and eternal didn't come from a school, didn't even come from a family member. They came from uh, sitting on the dock during lunch yeah. with my feet in the water. And I, I noticed that if I was really not only quiet, but quiet kid, little things would come up at my feet and they go tell others and then Suddenly, I had these little things swimming around my feet. And then it was time to go back to work. And I stirred, and all of these things disappeared. Yes. And that told me something about what gathers around you in your quieted moments. Yes. Uh, he went to Morehouse, much like Martin Luther King did. But mm -hmm. he was in, he had graduated in the early 1920s. Mm -hmm. uh, King was born in 29. And mm -hmm. his major was economics. So he was very much well aware of things, financial and economic. Mm -hmm. And then he decided to go to Divinity School at Crozier, the same Divinity School King would go to. Mm -hmm. uh, and he and uh, Daddy King, Martin Luther King Sr., were mm -hmm. good friends. Oh, okay. And uh, Thurman, also, Thurman also organized uh, missionary work through his church mm -hmm. to... Uh, Ceylon, Ceylon, which is now Sri Lanka, uh, Burma, which is now Myanmar, and India. And mm -hmm. Sue Thurman was really the lead here. She was the ambassador. Yes. And she looked like an Indian woman. She really did she, okay. uh, in her appearance. Uh, and so and she was just a, a very elegant, eloquent person. So mm -hmm. uh, the trip really was set up by uh, Sue Thurman. So in the last nice. two weeks of their mission, they got an audience with Gandhi and they met mm -hmm. to, went to meet with him in his ashram. And for five and a half hours, they sat there together and wow. talked. And, uh, and Gandhi would sing, sing them some, some Hindi songs mm -hmm. from his movement. And he asked them to sing some black spirituals uh, oh, for wow. him. And all during the time they were sitting, uh, Gandhi was in this squatting position he was famous for. Mm -hmm. next to his sharka spinning spinning cloth so for oh, five wow. hours wow and at the end of their conversation they got up to hug each other and so on and gandhi presented to the thermos this cloth he had been spinning all this time oh my gosh and whenever you want to visit thurman in his house at 2020 stockton street he would proudly go into his credenza and pull out that cloth wow he was so proud of it I bet. Uh, but he said uh, that that really was a profound experience for him. Yes. And it helped him to get to the young Martin Luther King uh, in the late 1940s when King came to Boston University to study for his doctorate. Mm -hmm. Because Thurman was had been the first black director of a Christian center called yes. the Marsh Center there. And that's okay. where he met the young, young Martin Luther King. And that's how the they connected. And, nice. uh, and then, of course, uh, Thurman decided that uh, the most segregated institution in the United States was the church. 
So he decided to establish a church in San Francisco, which is still going today, called the Fellowship of All Souls, wow. uh, where anybody of any background, Christian or not, could come. Awesome. And, uh, and then he got involved with the, the labor movement uh, in San Francisco, trying to get some spirituality to labor leaders and so on. So he was invited to speak one time uh, to the International Brotherhood of Longshoremen. And, you know, they were socialists and communists and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, he thought he was going to be praying. They thought he was just going to give a speech. So he got up there and he prayed, you know. And uh, after the prayer, he walked back to his seat. And on the way up to the podium was the president of the union who stopped him and hugged him and said, damn, that was good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oh, uh, and then... And then Thurman went on to San Francisco, and uh, for the last years of his life, he was very active in civil rights movement in uh, the San Francisco area, helped to found the San Francisco African American Historical and Cultural Society. Mm -hmm. And Mrs. Thurman uh, actually recruited me to membership in that society when I was in high school. Wow. So that's how we got a chance to know them. And oh, then began it. to read his books and so on. They right. So profound. So yes. Cool. Yes. He's a true mystic. Yes. You know, and for the listeners to understand too that Howard Thurman was a behind the scenes uh influencer yes. and scholar in regard to civil rights movement. Yeah. Exactly. Of and uh he, uh he he was he was physically behind the scenes but spiritually mm -hmm. out front. Yes. Yes, indeed. And, and uh, when King died, by the way, one of the things they found in his pocket was a copy of Thurman's book. Really? Wow. At the Lorraine Motel, right, right there in his breast pocket. Yep. Wow. In his breast, he had a, he had a smaller uh, version of it. Wow. Wow. Yeah, he had a copy of it in the breast, breast pocket of his coat. And wow. he, it was all marked up, you know, for years of reading it and rereading it and, wow. and so on. And, uh, and one of the things that people should remember about Martin Luther King Sr. and Jr. was that uh, their original names were not Martin Luther King. Oh, their that's original right. names were Michael King. And yes. yeah, and so Martin, Martin Luther King, along with Thurman a few, and others, went to a convention in uh, Berlin in the early 30s, mm -hmm. uh, international convention. And mm -hmm. they saw all these different sites where Martin Luther had. Uh, nailed the 99 thesis on the wall and so on. Mm -hmm. And they were so influenced by Luther that they came back and uh, Martin Luther King, Martin Sr. renamed himself Mike, um, from Michael to Martin and renamed his son Martin Luther King Jr. They also wrote a petition condemning Nazism and anti-Semitism, which was rising in, in Germany at the time they were there. Wow, wow. And he wrote that when he was there. That's just, it's so incredible. Uh, oh. It just, yeah, you're just, you're such a national treasure because you, you have had all of these up close experiences uh, and you, and you've lived the arc of all of this. And the fact that you, that you have retained um, a hopeful, uh, a hopeful spirit intellectually and, and spiritually um, and, 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 uh, and a hopeful mind um in both those ways too spiritually but i mean your mind is spiritual and intellectual but you're not a cynic is what i'm trying to say and that you defy the odds by being that uh and i i just it's it's quite it's quite amazing and and, and i just yeah it's yeah i i mean i there's so many things that could have made you um um another person um, you know, one thing I wanted to jump back to about policy with you, you shared a story recently, and then we can we can um, um, conclude pretty soon here, because I've kept you a long time. But I love the fact that I get to record all of your amazing stories for my own self. And then for also um, our listeners uh, at large in this country and then around the world who get to have the benefit of hearing the stories as well and your life experience. But back to policy, you shared a story knowing that I grew up in Alaska with, um, with a policy um, that you were able to implement to help um, with indigenous populations uh, retaining their land rights. Can you talk about that? 
Well, this comes from uh, the privilege of working in the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, this is in the 1970s. Okay. And um, at that time, uh, Alaska had been a state only for about 15 or 16 years. Okay. And one of the things people don't know about Alaska and Hawaii when they became states in 1959 was part of the agreement was that a certain percentage of the land was to go back to the indigenous people. Mm-hmm. And this happened in both both wow. states. And so the Alaskans actually inherited about 27 million acres of land right there. Wow. And then in 1991, with the Energy Department and uh, through the Congress, uh, Congress passed the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, okay. which gave the indigenous Alaskans, the Aleuts and the Athabascans and the Eskimos and others, uh, more than a billion dollars in cash. And... Wow. Uh, uh, technical assistance to create 13 regional corporations wow. where they could uh, develop the wealth coming from the land, not recognizing, however, this is where we were short-sighted, that as in a lot of indigenous cultures in the mainland, now 48 uh, states of the United States, um, you know, the indigenous population don't see land ownership the same way we do. It's it's titles are held in common and passed through the ancestry, not by title and passed through individuals. So we didn't understand that uh, well right. enough. But anyway, right. the Alaskans did organize and they do have 13 corporations in that state that uh, are very rich. And you know, Alaska is one of those states where there's no income tax. You actually get a royalty every year Mm-hmm. from oil and natural gas pipelines. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Alaskan, the Alaskan indigenous population uh, is part of that arrangement. And I was glad to, to know about that because, you know, down, down here, we don't really pay attention to things like that. And uh, right. one of the things that we're trying to address in social justice through the public policy process is land, labor, and capital. Yes. Three things that economists say make an economy right yes so yes. this is a land piece here this yes. is the land piece and when when black people are asking for reparations some of them not are asking not just for money but also in the case of omari obadali and the republic of new africa they want the united states to cede back to them five states where they were uh slaves and they were the dominant population yes. south and north carolina yes you know, georgia Mississippi, yes. Alabama, Arkansas. Yes. And yes. the indigenous population understands the criticality of land as part of this, not just to own yes. and not just to hold, but to supply in appropriate proportionate terms yes. the needs of the humanity there. Yes. Uh, that, that, that the gods, the ancestors and the gods intended for that to be the breadbasket but not the preoccupation of humans. Yes, beings. yes, and, yes. Uh, so we learned that from looking at the Alaskans and <clears throat> the mainland indigenous population, because as you know, out there in, in the West, there's the Council of Energy Resource Tribes, mm-hmm. the 26 tribes mm-hmm. that came together as a consortium to try to control more of the land that they own uh, against exploitation from U.S. and foreign investors. You know, so yes. This is a. This is something we're still. I'm still learning about. Yes. Wow. Wow. That's a. It's a. That's a really fascinating um, place uh, to end on on what we're talking about because um, yeah, it, it's really powerful because reparations absolutely need to uh, need to include the co- the consideration of property and land in, as you say to be able to to own but to share and to um, to utilize in, in affirming ways for a variety of reasons, you know, economically and so on. Uh, yeah, well, that comes just... back to the beginning. Comes back to the beginning of our conversation. Yeah. If reparations are to happen, yes. they're happening. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the algorithms of love and empathy ought to determine the proportions, and mm-hmm. not just some formula. Yes. Oh, goodness. That that's really wonderfully said. Yes, indeed. Indeed. And it's the it's the coming together. 
It's the shared humanity. It's the collaboration. It's understanding that we are all children of God. We are all called to support each other, to love each other. And it almost feels in this day and age, have you noticed this, that, you know, Martin Luther King led obviously with love, John Lewis as well. Uh, and yet I wonder in our age, is our, is our mission or our movement, is it empathy? It's uh, um, when I sing with kids yeah. and it's the same thing, I'm not saying, you know, not love, but I'm wondering if our storytelling or our narrative or the word that we've chosen is that because a lot of people, and I love this, are speaking empathy, the word and the sentiments and, and the consequences um, more, more often. It's, it, do you, do you see that too? I do. I do. And uh, uh, it's like my pastor said recently, he said, we're all all children of God, some of us are more juvenile than others. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, oh, I totally, yeah. I totally I really like got that. that. I, got that. I like that too. I, I do. I think that though, it, going back to that, that in the time, in this time, it's all, I feel like if Martin Luther King were alive um, in this day and age, because that tends to be a word that people use more comfortably um, and openly than love. Uh, and yet when I, when I teach my little pumpkins, um, I hold up these signs that say love and that empathy and I sing love is like empathy. So I talk about that really they're interchangeable and they're the same. However, if it's like, really mm -hmm, however, it's a comfort, um, I don't know. There's just something quite powerful about it and it's, it feels, yeah, it yeah. feels, it feels like it's a, I don't know if it's an empathy movement um, it organically that's been happening. Um, gosh, Brene Brown and other people were planting beautiful seeds, Dr. Brene Brown, uh, about that. And a lot of us, yes. you know, yeah, a lot of us have, you know, have have sprung from that. Uh, some of us who who felt felt a strong connection to empathy before, then when we heard her work, then it just it helped ignite um, us further. Uh, I think, because I think, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think, I, I can't remember when I, like when I wrote my books with empathy at the core, I, I don't know if I had, I don't think I had discovered her work yet. And so I think it's, there's a spiritual connection that feels like, and a reframing that feels like it was happening at a certain point that I feel is, is continuing to happen. And then going back to our, we did mention COVID-19 uh, pandemic paradigm and the negative consequences of it. And we could you know, talk at length, but we won't have the time today, but we know that marginalized uh, people were um, impacted by it disproportionately. Um, it, it, was, um, it, it affected um, them in ways um, that was um, you know, greatly pronounced and needs to be at least spoken right now. And, and, and then when we think about that time, going back to our conversation about empathy and introspection, um, given all the trauma of loss and suffering and loss of income and, and all of it that envelops everything we talked about today, the, um, the one shining um, um, morsel of, of optimism through it was the opportunity for introspection and depth of um, thinking about all of our lives and the value of everybody's life. I feel like it drew us in also to see our connection to one another uh, if, if we chose exactly. to, mm -hmm, to look at that. So, yeah. Well, but, I think one, one metaphoric realization I've come to about COVID is, is that sometimes in the human experience, it's the tiniest things on the inside that make the biggest changes on the outside. Wow. And uh, wow. So, so it's it, it, this harkens us to, to examine everything that is internal to us. Yes. Uh, that may not be visible all the time, but yes. can alter what we are, who we are, and what we're going to be. Yes. Yes. You know, that's so well said. And, and remember what Thurman talked about too. There's a story that he gave about um, they were in a plane and they only had so much um, fuel and they had to get rid of the inessential. And so they were having to drop out all the weight and all the different things from inside the plane. And that is such a powerful um, metaphor and, and um, consideration when we think about 
um, that perspective piece, that deciding, um, the deciding where to put one's energy um, as human beings, but okay. as as a shared humanity too, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's yeah. Well, uh, in the world of ge geology, world of geology and physics, the hottest place is the core of something. Wow. That's true. Yep. Yeah. That's. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's, oh, it's, oh my gosh, it's so true, isn't it? Wow. So, so, wow. so, so how hot, how hot is our core? Yeah, I don't even know. How hot is the core? Yeah, no, no, I mean. Oh, uh, you mean, the, oh, theoretically. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I thought you were asking me for yeah. number. Yeah. Oh, I get you. Um, I got it. Um, yeah, so exactly. So, so hot, so how hot is the core? What's the, yeah, what? what yeah i get it yep. i get it yep. yeah it's um yeah it's it's um yeah it's quite deep and 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 the fact that it was well i this i know i'm stating the obvious but but to have an entire world stand up for the brutal killing of george floyd juxtaposed yes. with with a worldwide pandemic where their very lives were at risk if they protested uh even for infection for people in our entire world at that time to stand up is so profound i can't yes. even yeah yeah i can't even put that into words and yet the, the time the time um had that kind of outcome how could tell with your beautiful um ability to communicate can you word that even better because i i just i'm stumbling because it's so profound and overwhelming well, for me you, to contemplate. i think, I think you're, you're articulating you're i think you articulated it very well uh oh, thanks you know it's in those you remember that there was a song in the doo-wop era <clears throat> called this magic moment mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um we we don't recognize how many magic moments we have. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, the failure to let a magic moment go by without extending it at time is yeah. one of our failures. Yes. So that was a magic moment. Yes. And we've had a number of since then. Yes. <clears throat> and I hope we will continue to generate those because it's yes. on those that, you know, eternity hangs. Right? Yes. Oh. A magic moment is really an eternal, an eternal moment. So uh, would George Floyd have ever imagined himself <clears throat> that he would be uh, in the middle of something like this through his death? I mean, he, right. you know, no. he, he, it'd be hard for him to imagine. You know? But wow. uh, so we have a lot of magic moments like that. And uh, this is why <clears throat> I appreciate very much the leadership and the work that you do through the fund, because it's in the magic moment generating business yes yes they, oh gosh that's really that's so so thoughtful that you say that and i and i i sure i sure aspire to that and i sure have that intention and and humbly so um to god my higher power you and everybody else working um on the board with me i um i think i will go ahead and end there and oh my gosh thank you so much ending on the magic magic moments that we've seen and magic moments to come i think that's a great place to end thank exactly. you so well, yes. thank you thank you thank you appreciate it thank uh, you and, and go out there and have as much fun as you can get away with <laughs> you too. Thank you so much, Dr. Laniel Henderson. Gosh, I just want to, again, thank you so much, Dr. Laniel Henderson, for your mentorship, for being my professor, for being on my dissertation committee, for coming along on the journey uh, to help us with a founding nonprofit organization of Sissy Mary Sue Education Fund, you had made a commitment a long time ago to me in a letter of recommendation saying that anything that I did in the future, that you wanted to offer yourself pro bono and that you would be there for me. Now, people get busy in life, and I understand that. And so I didn't know if you would have the time and if that would come to fruition. But yet you are a man of your word, and you meant that. And so here we are.
having a beautiful collaboration with me as uh, exec director and you as the president of this board. It is an amazing privilege and honor to get to serve with you and to plan with you and to continue to learn from you. Thank you so much again for this conversation. Thank you so much for all that you are to me, to so many, to countless students at the three different colleges where you are a, you are a professor and a dean at one of them. And thank you on behalf of all of the people on our board of directors our interns and everyone were able to serve uh, as a result of this nonprofit. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening and thank you for coming along on this journey through a conversation today. Sissy Mary Sue Education Fund's Educating Empathy podcast is available to you all. As we say goodbye, we want to share that we hope that you are well and we send our love and our empathy. Until next time. Thank mm-hmm. you.